uh, the sunk cost fallacy of the Democrats. So this was brought up to me by actually an old um, uh, history teacher of mine. Uh, he was he was a, a my world history teacher and uh, one of the teachers that always like pushed you to uh, think critically and things of that sort. Um, and he watches some of the videos that I make and he watches some of my stand up and stuff. And it, it's very cool that he does that. I always get excited when he starts leaving comments and stuff. Um, but he pointed out, you know, from last week's live stream, uh, I was getting a little amped up and kept saying why people support the Democratic Party when, you know, we have all this evidence now. We have, you know, all these things are coming to the light about how truly terrible they are and truly how they don't give a shit about the working class, right? And now we've seen even more evidence of that with the way that they're, uh, they're, they're dealing with the minimum wage issue. Why do people still support this party? You know, and why is it that whenever we bring up these issues with the Democratic Party, do these liberals and do the blue MAGA attack the left, attack the, the true, the, what, I, what I like to say is the true left, right? And he pointed out that to look up the sunk cost fallacy. So I did. I, it's, it's very interesting. I, I like psychology a lot. Um, it helps kind of understand why people do what they do. And uh, even just for myself. Right. Like, like sometimes I look it up and be like, oh, fuck, I fucking do that shit. Oh, no. <laughs> and it makes it makes you kind of face the reality for yourself. So the sunk cost fallacy is um, it can be it, this goes into various different things. Right. You can. Uh, you, you can you can see it in relationships, the way people spend their money and the way people make their decisions in politics. Uh, or or what what side they choose to ally themselves with. It's a tendency for people to pursue an option they feel negatively towards because they've invested money, time, and other resources. Uh, and henceforth, they see that as the best decision, even though it's proving to be quite the opposite. Right? A and a lot of the articles they talk about is like, oh, you purchased a ticket and then you can't go to the concert for whatever reason. Um, or or it's a party that you want to go to and, and then like the day comes and you're like, ah, oh, I really don't want to go, but you know, I made this commitment and I'm and I'm supporting a friend and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. Um and then you go anyway, even though you didn't want to fucking go to this party. Or, or you're sick and you can't go to this concert, but you bought a ticket for it. And so then you go anyway and you make the, the situation worse. It's just, it's, it, it, the, the thing that the, a lot of the articles that discuss sunk cost fallacy do is that they talk about it in terms of relationships. Um, that too many people stay in relationships that are not necessarily, I mean, I think if you're in an abusive relationship, you can use the sunk cost fallacy as as a way to rationalize what's going on, um, and and I've done that before. Um, but you know, it's it's staying in a relationship that two people have kind of grown apart, and they're kind of together because of the convenience of it, or because it's like, okay, well, you know, I've been with this person for four years, and yeah, we kind of like don't really do stuff together anymore, but we have this apartment and we have this animal or what have you. And they decide to stay in that relationship for months, years, so on and so forth, right? When when the reality is you two don't hate each other. You guys just don't feel that romantic, what have you. And you guys still love each other and care about each other, but it doesn't need to be in the context of a relationship or, or a romantic relationship. And that's okay. But instead of having that conversation, both parties are just like, whatever, it's cool. We'll just, we'll just live in this weird, awkward thing that we're in because it's comfortable and it's nice, right? Uh, and the longer you stay in that relationship, the harder it is for people to get out of it. Uh, I've done it. Definitely been in a relationship where it was very clear that both parties involved were um, not having a good time. <laughs> uh, they were, you know, like we, we both were kind of growing apart. 
the direction that we were going in is completely different. And uh, and then we ended up staying together for like a year and a half until she decided to break up with me. Um, you know, so I was I was kind of the coward in that situation of like, I don't want to lose this person. And part of that, too, it, it, to go into my own personal psychology of that. At that point in time, it was my early 20s. This was the first real relationship that I had had. And I, I felt like I would never get another relationship like that. I would never find someone who would love me and care about me and, you know, w- was attractive and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And that was a self-esteem issue for me, as well as this notion of comfort. So there was, there was layers to all of this, right? Um, when it comes to economics, it's getting what you paid for, right? So, and I have also done that. <laughs> I did this earlier today, man, where I had I had like some milk left in the fridge, and uh, you know I have not used this milk in a couple of weeks, and it's just like a little bit of milk left, and I had to throw it away. And I hate wasting food. That's like a pet peeve of mine that I that I picked up with my mom, I think. And, uh, and I was like, fuck, I got to pour this. And I opened it and it smelled bad. And I was like, yeah, but I spent money on this. And I know it's not a, like, like a a half a gallon of milk is not super expensive, but I definitely, (laughs) I was definitely like, well, I can just make cereal, right? Like I can just use, like, maybe it's not that bad. (laughs) And, but it's a sunk cost. I, I was like, I already paid for that. I already put money into it. I should get the, I should get the most out of this right? Like, even though the decision would have meant that as I was doing this live stream, I would have probably pooped my pants if I had done that. I chose not to. I threw the milk away. I, 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 I dumped it and threw it away. But I very much considered not doing that. Because I was like, oh, I already paid money for it. Why am I, you know, I also shouldn't waste food. America, globally, we waste 40% of food. I shouldn't be part of that problem. You know, but it's like, no, 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 this is good for your fucking health. (laughs) You know. So when it comes to the Democratic Party, you can look at it in terms of both financial, the economics and the relationship aspect of it. Right. So so, uh, these these folks that truly support Democrats. And and look, I've even heard people that are like, well, I don't. So I'm not a Democrat. I'm not registered as a Democrat, but I think this party I've, I've supported this party for so long. Like, I, I believe that this party does good for so long. Um, I can't change that. And look, I've done that too, right? When I was, when I was younger, in, in my teens and early 20s, when I was just getting into and learning about politics, I had a tough time. I mean, when I was in college when Obama got uh, elected and inaugurated, and like we went to a parade that was happening in Pittsburgh, um, over Obama's, uh, inauguration. And, and, and it, it was like this once in a lifetime event, um, you know, that this is America's first black president. We're never going to see that sort of stuff again. And I genuinely felt like, oh man, this is going to be a big change for the country. And boy, what an exciting direction we're going. And it was difficult for me to look at, objectively at what this administration was doing and objectively at what past Democrat administrations were doing. And I, for, for a little while, had a hard time because I was like, fuck, this is the party that I have been told for years now is the good guys, that they care about immigrants, that they care about communities of color and they want to give people health care and taxes and blah, blah, blah. So I understand the fear of that. But once I saw the party for what it was, I was able to just kind of let it go and kind of not rebuild, but reaffirm some of the things that I believed in and kind of, you know, go go the path that I wanted to go. Uh, and, and, I, and I think I became more true to myself. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel like I had to make excuses. Like, I feel like people that, that have this sunk cost fallacy with the Democratic Party, um, the reason why they have a hard time is like, they have to do these mental gymnastics in order to keep rationalizing, supporting the Democratic Party. 
They got to jump through some hoops. And I felt like doing that was so much more exhausting than just being like, yeah, this party fucking sucks. And so I'm going to leave it and support other parties. Other parties have also disappointed. <laughs> On a national level, I didn't like what the Green Party did. And that really sucked for me, too. That was a tough thing for me to, to learn earlier this year was uh, I like the Green Party. I think a, a lot of what they stand for and a lot of local chapters of the Green Party, like uh, uh, upper, uh, what is it? upstate South Carolina Green Party, uh, those folks are super supportive. Uh, the Indiana Green Party has been super supportive. They've come to shows. We've had conversations. I've done gigs for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe in that. On a national level, I didn't like what they did last year. Uh, you know, so that was difficult because I, had, I, I am a proponent of third party. So intellectually, I have put this cost into supporting the third parties and the third party that I, you know, closely or, or the third party that closely tied into what I believe in decided to do something that the Democrats did in 2016. And that kind of fucked with my head. And I was just like, man, this fucking blows. And it happened to me again with Tulsi Gabbard twice. It happened with Bernie Sanders again. Where when he fucking endorsed Joe Biden and Tulsi endorsed Joe Biden, my head was just like, what the fuck is happening right now? And for a day, I was angry and disappointed. And the same thing happened again with Tulsi a couple weeks ago with the Title IX shit. Where she has the 100% rating with LGBTQ plus communities. She's legislated to ensure that there is no discrimination in the workplace for the LGBTQ community, and then she goes and writes, a, and then she goes and supports a bill that is discriminatory. I was just like, what is happening right now? And part of me was like, well, let me figure out if there is a rationalization. And I couldn't find one. Because here's the, here's the, the, the two sides to it that don't match up. Yeah, is, yes, I support a lot of what Tulsi has to say, like her her um, anti-militarism, anti-imperialism, her support for Julian Assange. I liked her um, Medicare for All plan. I thought she had a, a good head on her shoulders, and I fucking love that she slammed Kamala Harris in that second debate. But now I have to rationalize, how do I support trans people and what Tulsi is doing with Title IX? And, and I can't do that. So I don't support Tulsi because of the Title IX thing. I still believe in anti-imperialism and anti-militarism, and I still support Julian Assange, and I will give her credit where credit is due, but I will not give her credit where credit is not due. And the sunk cost fallacy does not allow you to do that. So I saw a lot of people who had sunk both intellectual beliefs and finances where they donated to shit ton to our campaign that were trying to figure out a way to rationalize Title IX, and they were all really terrible fucking viewpoints. They were like, uh, they were the equivalent of trash fire hot takes. Those hot takes were about as hot as a, as a garbage fire. That's what it was. So if someone like me can look at Tulsi Gabbard and say, okay, she has done some good things, but she's done some horrific things that go against some of the good things that she's done. So I no longer want to support this individual. I don't see why the Democrats, I'm talking about voters here, I'm talking about liberals, the blue MAGA, the people that I know are intellectually smart enough to look at the history of the party and know that from the get-go, the Democrats back in the 1800s were fucking supporting private industry. They were getting money from fucking private industries, lumber, coal, uh, railways. And it wasn't until William McKinney, McKinley showed up and he was like, well, fuck this. I'm going to go and get money from them. I'm going to promise the, <laughs> the private industry even more. And that's when the GOP started becoming, uh, you know, a, a party for the private. The Democrats have never fucking been a party of the people. 
I know these people have the intellectual capacity to know this sort of shit. I'm a fucking idiot comedian. I decided it was a good idea to go into the deep south and talk about socialism on stage. Gee, I've, I've been threatened to be murdered several times in my career. And I figured this out. Do you know how stupid I am? That that was a line of work where I was like, this is a good idea. Oh, people are threatening me? I should still keep doing this. And I figured out this shit. It's not that hard. Yes, you have sunk your intellectual beliefs into this party, but this party no longer represents your intellectual beliefs. It doesn't represent your, your, your core ideologies, and it doesn't support you. So, th so that's the fallacy end of it. But because, you've, because you've, you've, you've listened to some propaganda, you've listened to corporate media, you believe that this party does. And you can't rationalize two sides of it. So what do you do? You, uh, you either ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen, right? You, you, you look at things like what Joe Biden is doing with this racial equity stuff, and you look at all this and you go, yeah, prison industrial complex has been defeated by Joe. No, 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 it hasn't been. The reason why Joe Biden is doing this is not because he's, he, he, he's like, oh, my God, the prison is certain complex is bad. No, it's because we put pressure on him. And if he doesn't fucking do it, then he's, then he's going to lose support. And he has already claimed that he is the Democratic Party. And if Joe Biden loses support, the party loses support, and we can't do that. Now, of course, there are Democratic supporters that support the party for what it does. They 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 wholeheartedly believe that that regard you know their racist crime laws were oh well it was the time right and it's like okay not really uh, d let's look at why people commit crimes. We've been watching Criminal Minds, um, with, and we're on some of the Mandy Patinkin uh, episodes the the season. Very attractive older gentleman, by the way, Mandy Patinkin. Uh, aged like a, a very fine wine, uh, good looking man, v fit too uh, for for an older gentleman. But the reason I like Criminal Minds as as a network television show, it still glorifies the FBI and and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there there's still you know some issues where like, yeah, okay, that's three episodes in a row where they just shot the fucking dude. I but. The thing I like about it is the psychology aspect. They look at why people commit crimes rather than, oh, well, this is a bad, like, it makes you be like, ah, oh, fuck, maybe this guy, you know, maybe if, maybe if the system, maybe if the world would have been better to this person, maybe if, maybe if the, the economic system would have been a little bit better. And they subtly do approach it. They're on CBS, so they can't just be like, capitalism created, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I like that they go into that on the level that they go into it on network television. I would challenge Democrats that that um, that are experiencing this sunk cost fallacy, where it's like, "Fuck, I'm I'm dedicated to this party. I've been registered and voting and supporting and donating and doing all this stuff for this party, and I feel like I'm not getting something in return. But I feel like I've been I'm being told that they're they're doing good for me. Am I seeing it? No, but maybe I'm, you, you know. And you kind of have to play these mental gymnastics and and rationalize and, and, and figure out how to do, like, I would challenge these people to say, one, you're not alone. Uh, you don't have to fear that. Even me, who has been vitriolically attacked by a bunch of these uh, blue MAGA folks and liberals and so on and so forth, if you came up and said, "Hey, I fucked up," and I, you, you know, t tell me more. What, what, can you recommend some videos and articles or what have you? I would gladly be like, "Yes, cool. Let's let's talk about it. Here are some links. Read them at your leisure. When you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them with my best of my ability." And I bet you, most of the progressive community, most of the true left, would fucking do that too. Yeah, you've put a lot of money into it, but guess what? You're in a fucking abusive relationship. You're in a relationship where only one side is benefiting. And then it's telling you lies that you're benefiting by supporting them. You have already sunk that cost. You don't have to live in the fallacy. You can, you can accept that that cost, you believed at the time that the cost was for something good, but is no longer yielding that good. 
you don't have to you don't have to keep going being like, well, fuck, I'm trapped in doing this thing. You don't have to be trapped anymore. The easiest way to get out of the Democratic Party is just to fucking stop registering for that party. Just don't register for it anymore. Dude, if there was a mass deregistration po- happening across the country from the Democratic and the Republican Party, holy shit would that send them a message. You have sunk your costs. You can accept that. To get a little bit more uh, personal about me, I mean, I had to do that with, with, with my marriage. I f- had sunk, that, sunk a lot of costs, emotional, physical, financial, what have you. And when things took a turn for the worse, which they did several times, and they got more emotionally abusive and and ramped up from there, keep hitting this microphone. Um, I had to I had to accept that, look, I sunk the cost and the cost is lost. But I don't have to keep losing more. What's better for me to do is to leave this situation and and try to build a better one. And that's what the Democrats, the the blue bag of folks that have to over rationalize and they use things like, oh, straw man or or blah, 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 or Trump derangement syndrome, what have whatever it is. You have an opportunity now to accept that the cost is lost, but not all of you, not all of it. You can rebuild it, and there are people that will fucking help you rebuild it. And instead of shitting on them, you can, you know, you can join them, and you can learn from them, and you can disagree with them as long as you do it civilly. That, that is something that they can do. This, this sunk cost fallacy doesn't have to be the be-all, end-all of things. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's look at the, the comments and wrap it up. Yes, he was a cool teacher. I liked him a lot. I, I, I learned a lot of cool shit from him and, uh, and, and even just talking to him, uh, you know, as an adult, uh, what really sucks is, uh, when, when we started talking, I was just like, man, it would just be cool to like sit and have a beer as an adult with you. Like I did that with one of my teachers a couple years ago, uh, one of the teachers said, help me get into stand up. I ended up seeing him at a show and he was taking photographs and stuff. And we just like hung out while the band was playing and having a beer and like bullshitting and enjoying some music. And it was awesome. Uh, it's, it's this weird thing. Like when you can do that with teachers, you know, uh, hashtag where's the 2000. Yeah, exactly. Where? Yeah. It's maybe it's in Joe Biden's bunker. <laughs> maybe it's down there. Has anyone looked in his Delaware bunker? Jen, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. People fear change. They sure do. Uh, change is hard. Change is scary. Uh, but change can be good. Um, you just have to have the courage to change the situation that you're in. Uh, easier said than done. And, and this is not me saying, oh, well, people should pick themselves up by their boot. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying there are actions that you can take to make your situation better. It might not be 100% better uh, because complex power structures and so on and so forth but you don't need to be afraid of of making some of the minor changes that are going to be better for you holly this is in regards to the green party controversy i liked dario hunter as well she she said she wrote in dario hunter i like dario as well um i wish dario would have been given a fair chance uh i like the way dario spoke i liked a lot of the issues he was presenting um so i i hope that you know there's some sort of reformation within the green party and uh and again, I, I really think there should be they should be allowed as much um, political gravitas, let's call it, as the Dems and the Republicans. They should be allowed on all the ballots. They should be given ballot access. Um, and, you know, we should be a little bit more uh, equal of a country rather than putting everything in one box or the other. Right. That's not how people it's not how belief systems work. The Biden, this is regarding the Tulsi, yeah, the Biden endorsement broke the deal. I was very upset about that. And the Tulsi 909 was awful. Yeah, I was, I was pretty uh, upset about that shit, too. Um, those, those were the two tough ones to kind of reconcile and still kind of keep some kind of support with Tulsi. But by the Title IX thing, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep an eye on what she's doing to keep 
you know, keep an eye on what she's doing. But um, especially after Bernie supporting Biden and, and everything that happened with Tulsi and now Bernie voting for, you know, all of these fucking war criminals and um, corporate criminals and crypto fascists like. It, I'm just like, you know, I'm not going to put my total support into any politician. I'm I'm going to focus on the ideas. Ron, Ron Placone and I talked about that earlier this year as well. Um, it is, I'm, I don't think I'm going to push for any candidates. I am going to push more for ideas. Uh, Jen, I don't think people are, uh, I don't think people are feeling commitment to the democratic party itself. I think they're feeling the bond with other people who have labeled themselves Dems. Uh, when, when your eyes are on people who you agree with, you lose sight of, uh, your actual part, uh, you lose sight that your actual party doesn't represent what you and yours agree with. Yes, I do think that there is a social component to it as well. And that is, that is an excellent point to bring up. Uh, there is a social component to it. Uh, you know, birds of a feather kind of, kind of a thing. Um, I, I don't think I've lost friends. It's just made it more difficult to address politics and and be a hundred percent authentic with people that um, that line up with the Democratic Party because they don't. And, and a part of it is also like, oh, I don't want to get canceled for saying the wrong thing or what have you, um, you know. And uh, that that concern pops up in my head, being somewhat of a public figure of like, oh shit, if I say anything about the party that I know X Y Z friend is not going to like, am I not going to have that friend anymore? Um, but you know, again. If that's going to be the deal breaker, because it's not a deal breaker for me as long as you're respectful uh, to me and who I am and uh, so on and so forth. Maybe that person wasn't your friend to begin with. And maybe these 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 people who know that the Democratic Party has failed them, but are doing it because, oh, shit, I, I run in social circles where being a Democrat is the cool thing. Well, maybe these people aren't your friends to begin with, you know, uh, they can be acquaintances. They can be people that you see, but if they're gonna if they're gonna dump you for for being a Bernie Sanders supporter instead of a Joe Biden supporter, uh, you know how how close of friends were you? How much did they know who you really were? How much did they accept who you really were? Um, and I'm not saying that is a depressing thing. I've had to face that reality multiple times in my life, uh, where I was like, holy shit, how much you know? How much of a friend is this person when I can't be my authentic self around them? That I feel guilty for being who I am around them. Um, you know, maybe I should reevaluate the 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 terms of this friendship. Um, and again, I have friends that are uh, hardcore Democrats, and and we just don't get into politics all that much. Uh, we get into other topics of conversation that that are just fine, and it and it does take your friendship down one notch, but maybe that's for the best, right? So yeah, I think there's a, there's a hundred percent of social component that's some cost fallacy. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook, especially Facebook and YouTube. They often uncensor people, uh, un unsubscribe people, and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody 
to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. And I hope to see you at the next video.